Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Well, we're going to start off tonight with someone who you don't want to be, and that's the oldest living person in the world. You got yourself a target on your back at that point. We just did the podcast on the oldest living person in the world, Messiah Okao, who died at the age of 117. And that made Gertrude Weaver from Arkansas the oldest living person in the world, and she was 116, destined to be 117 on July 4th, 2015. Well, I'm sad to report that Gertrude only enjoyed the title for five days because she died recently at the age of, as I said, 116. Here's a brief report on Gertrude in happier times when she took over the title as the oldest living person and she was busy enjoying her five-day reign. The world's oldest person, born in 1898, 116-year-old Gertrude Weaver, celebrated her milestone today with her family. Gertrude, even proud to admit she's checked off everything on her bucket list, reflecting on all her years, Gertrude has fond memories of family, gardening, quilting, and cooking, especially pies. Her granddaughter helps her explain the secret to longevity. Hard work, love God, put him first in everything, and love one another. Pretty simple and good advice. Now, if Gertrude could do it all over again, she says she wouldn't change a thing. She turns 117 on July 4th. Gertrude became the world's oldest person after the passing of Japan's Masao Okawa today. She was 117. And to put this all in perspective, Donna, William McKinley was president at the time. And when Gertrude was seven years old, mm -hmm. the Ford Model T was introduced. <laughs> Sounds to me like one of the secrets of longevity is not becoming the oldest living person in the world. Gertrude should have stayed at number two. Anyway, the person with the target on their back now is Geraldine Talley from Inkster, Michigan. She'll turn 116 a little later this year. One of the last surviving people born in the 19th century. And all I can say is good luck, Geraldine. We're going to move on now to Lon Simmons, who died recently at the age of 91. And Lon Simmons was one of those legendary baseball broadcasters. He broadcast for almost 50 years, primarily with the San Francisco Giants. He's a legend in the Bay Area. He moved for a while to the Oakland A's and then moved back to the Giants. And he also did the 49ers for almost a quarter of a century. I think it's fair to say that Lon Simmons is to Northern California what Vin Scully is to Southern California. When Lon Simmons covered the Giants when they moved out to San Francisco from New York in 1958, and that means he covered the great San Francisco Giant teams of the early 1960s, the ones we talked about when we did the Alvin Dark podcast. And that means he covered a lot of great players, but no question, the greatest he covered was Willie Mays. Here's his call of Willie's 600th home run. Here's a pitch to Willie. One on, it beats the left. That one is way back, way back, way back. What a three-five number 600th for Willie Mays. Have a bye-bye. The Bye Bye Baby Bonanza was in honor of his broadcasting partner in the 60s, Russ Hodges, one of the most famous broadcasters of all time. He was the Giants announcer in the 50s. He was covering the Giants in New York before they moved out to San Francisco. And of course, he's the one who made the most famous call of all time, the Giants win the pennant in 1951. That was our first podcast when we did Bobby Thompson. Russ Hodges and Lon Simmons had a great chemistry together. Here they're calling a fight between the Giants and the 62 Mets, one of the worst teams of all time. And they do a great play-by-play -play on the fight. Shea Bluffs now, now throw to second base, and Mays is back in. And now the Chacon starts hitting Mays, Mays dead time, and Zepeda and Craig are at it. Zepeda and Craig, and Zepeda gets in a left hook. Boy, we've got a brawl at second base. As Chacon started hitting Mays on top of the head as they were lying there, Mays picked Chacon up and threw him on the ground. Zapata swung a left hook and almost decked Craig. We've got ball players all over there. Russ, I don't know what that was about. Mays slid into second, and Chacon just started hitting him on the head. And Mays picked Chacon up and threw him down on the ground. Zapata came over and swung a beautiful left hook that nailed Roger Craig right on the button. Uh, Lon, I've seen some good ones, but this is the best when they get squared off individually like that. I don't think there's any question what Lon Simmons' most famous call was, and it wasn't a baseball game. It was in a 1964 game between the 49ers and the Vikings, where the Vikings' Jim Marshall picked up a fumble and ran the wrong way. Myra straight back to pass. Looking. Stops, throws, completes it to Kilmer up at the 30-yard line. Kilmer driving for the first down, loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way. We're going to 
move on now to our feature tonight, James Best, who died recently at the age of 88. He was one of the great character actors in television and in the movies. Even if you don't know him by name, you've seen him before. Best known for his portrayal of Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane on the 1980s show The Dukes of Hazard. He generally played a bumpkin, but in reality, he was a very meticulous actor. He opened an acting school, which had a lot of great people come to it. He wrote a great autobiography. He was very close friends with Jimmy Stewart and Paul Newman. He was born Jules Guy in Muhlenberg, Kentucky, and here's something most of the obits didn't tell you. His cousins were the Everly Brothers. As you know, when we did the Phil Everly podcast, they were from Muhlenberg. James Best's mother was Ike Everly's sister. Ike Everly was the father of the Everly Brothers. He served honorably in World War II, and in fact, that's how he got into acting, and here he talks about it. After the war, there was what they call werewolf gangs in Wiesbaden, Germany. And uh, they were teenagers that had actually been trained by the SS. Actually, a lot of them fought in the war. They were like 12 year old. They'd get on a bicycle with a bazooka and fight the Russians with tanks. Uh, so they were rough. Well, we had to clean up the town, being about that. So I was getting shot at more than most people did in the war, you know. And I, uh, I was going up to uh, get a cup of coffee and a donut at the PX and the exchange and. Uh, a girl walked down the steps, and she had a green uniform on with C-A-T on her shoulder. I said, come into here a bit. I said, come here, please, in German. And she, she said, I beg your pardon. I said, are you an American? And she said, yes. And I said, what's going on? I said, what is the C-A-T? She said, a civilian actress technician. And I said, uh, what is that? I'm an old country boy. I'm there from Parade. You know, I didn't know that much about anything. I had never seen a play. She said, well, we're doing a play at the Wiesbaden Opera House. She said, well, I won't go out with you unless you come see the play. I said, I don't want to see the play. I'll pick up after it. She said, no, that's not the way it's going to work. So I go over to, the, to see the play. I'm sitting in the audience, old country boy. The curtain goes up. And I'm like a kid in Disneyland. And I could not believe this. This was like another world. I go back to the stage to pick up the young lady, and here's G.I. is getting dressed out of the, from, a, from the show. I said, wait a minute, I'm a sergeant. What are these guys? And they said, they're in the show. They tour. They're treated like officers. We tour around the French, British, American zone. I'm getting shot at every night, and these guys are traveling around with you pretty girls. I'm in the wrong outfit. So I went to my commanding officer transferred me into special service. I started acting, and I acted with these professional people and learned my craft. So later on, when I came back to the States, I hitchhiked in New York to be an actor. I had that experience. I spent about three years in New York, did a Broadway show in summer stock, winter stock, and then put under contract Universal in 1949. Now I was there for two years. He knew Rod Serling very well from working with Paul Newman on The Rack, which Rod Serling wrote. Rod Serling put him in three memorable episodes of Twilight Zone. The most memorable one was The Grave, which had the greatest cast in Twilight Zone history and one of the greatest casts in television history. Lee Marvin is the star. The supporting actors are James Best, Struther Martin before Cool Hand Luke, Lee Van Cleef between High Noon and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Tell me something, Connie. Are you afraid of Pinto's grave? The rest of us are. Now, how about you? Are you afraid? No. I'm going to tell you something, Johnny Rob. I was never afraid of Pinto when he was alive, and I sure ain't afraid of him now that he's dead. And I don't believe that. I'll tell you. I ain't armed. I ain't armed. Oh, now, Connie, simmer down. Let's not have any bloodshed. Nobody calls me a coward. Now, you didn't let me finish what I was going to say, Connie. I don't think you're a coward. Leastwise, I don't think you're afraid of anybody in this room. Especially not me. I'm just a poor old boy. I work hard for not too much. But dogs and kids, they like me. They follow me around all the time. Sure is windy tonight, ain't it? And no, sir. I don't think there's anybody afraid of me. And whether you were afraid of Pinto alive, only you know that. But what I was going to say before you hit me and hurt me was, well, now, I'll bet, I'm not accusing you, understand, but I'll bet that you won't call on Pinto tonight. Why don't you shut up before you really get hurt? It's almost midnight. Now, I'll bet you, you won't walk out of here at midnight sharp and visit Pinto's grave. Now, I got a $20 gold piece. Now, I'll bet you... I'll bet you this $20 gold piece that took me 20 weeks to save that you won't do what I just said. I'm going to tell you something, boy. I don't like you. I never have, and I don't reckon I ever will. So old Blabbermouth got herself a $20 gold piece, huh? Well, I just happen to have one, too, and it just covers yours. Well, I guess in a little while that one of us will have $40 instead of 20 That's right. And when I get back, I don't want you hanging around here where I can see you. You understand? Connie, 
You haven't got another 20 you want to put up on that, have you? Another Twilight Zone episode was The Last Rites of Jeff Merlebeck. He was a very good-looking guy, and it's a really memorable scene where he comes out of his coffin. Who in tarnation put me in that coffin? <laughs> Brethren, let's not give way to panic. All mistakes seems to have been made. Brother Sidden, seems you've got a little sense left. Now, what's going on around here? Son, we was about to bury you. Bury We was real certain that you died day before yesterday. Died? Well, that's silly. Doc Bolton pronounced you dead. That's right, son. Your heart stopped beating two days ago. I was at the bedside. That couldn't be. I'm breathing now. Well, it sure wasn't beating day before yesterday. You was sick, son. Real sick. Worst case of flu I've ever come across in my whole medical career. I'm surprised he lasted past last Wednesday. Well, I hate to cast a shadow on your medical career, Doc, but I'm not going to crawl back in that coffin just to save face with you. Yes, sir. There was no question about it. There was no pulse. Well, I'm sure glad you didn't embalm me. How do you feel now, son? Well, I feel good. Uh, I feel a little weak, but uh, rested. Hungry. Well, I can eat the hide off a bear. He was in a memorable Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode, The Jar, based on a story by Ray Bradbury, but his iconic role was in The Dukes of Hazzard, and here he talks about how he got the job. I was doing Hooper with Fred Reynolds. I'd written a script, performed on it, and Dorothy and I were getting ready to go down to Florida on a little vacation. My agent called and said, I want to send you over on a on a series. And I said, a series? And it says, called Dukes of Hazzard. I said, I don't want to do a gang thing. I really don't. And they said, no, this is a good old boy thing, and they're going to shoot it in Conyers, Georgia. Well, I had produced a picture for Burt Reynolds called Gator, and Burt and I did the rewrites on it, and we shot it. It made money. Said, I said, you're going to shoot it in Conyers, Georgia? The fishing's good. The people are nice. And they're going to shoot the whole series in? And they said, yeah. So I go over there, and here is the producer and the director and the writers and the Inquisition they're sitting there in a bunch of chairs, and they had one chair sitting out in front. And I sat down, and they said, what is it? And it's a sure. And I said, how do you want me to play? And they said, well, we would like for him to be amusing and funny. And I said, well, I played a lot of heavies, but I did. I starred with Jerry Lewis in a movie called Three on the Couch. I said, I can do comedy. I did that in summer stock. So I thought, what am I going to do? Because I do not want to embarrass the sheriffs in this world. Because I have too much respect for the fire department and, and the sheriffs and, and, and the military. So I said, I'll play him like a 12-year-old who likes hot pursuit. And when I said, let me read the script. I read the script, and when I'm reading it, I did what I used to, to do with my little girls when they were little, and I'd see chasing them, and I'd go, Could you do good? you see your little rascal? Well, they fell off their chair, and they signed me. I was the first one they put under contract. And we shot five episodes down in Conyers, Georgia, and then they moved it back to that cesspool called L.A. I finally got a dog on the show, though. You know, I went to the dog pound and got Flash and put her on the show. I'm, I'm being naughty. <laughs> But anyway, I said, give me a dog. You know, it'll make some different type of scripts, and scripts are so much alike. And so they didn't want to do it at first. And I said, well, I'll quit. I want a dog. So I, we, we went to the dog pound, got Flash. She was seven years old. She lived to be 14, became one of the biggest stars on the show. Here's a little bit of that bumpkin humor he refers to from Dukes of Hazzard. Your job is in Well, this time those Duke boys are going too far. What a time for them to pull a fool trick. Maybe it's Halloween. You, you dipstick! Halloween's in November! Or is it October? Let's see. You idiots! The Duke boys are in on this whole kidnapping! Now you get moving! I want them boys in jail! Enos, what the heck are you doing here? You're supposed to be following those people that stole Loretta Lynn! Well, you said to follow you, ain't that right? Monkey see, monkey do. Oh, monkey see, monkey do do you, you dipstick! I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. James Best was content being a character actor. I never wanted to be a leading man. Universal tried to train me for as a leading man, and I said, ah, let me be the character man, because I said I'll be still be acting when I'm 80. I'll be 84 next month, and I'm still acting. And a lot of the leading men are <laughs> long gone. Right. Uh, they all lost their hair and their teeth, and <laughs> thank God I still got mine. Yeah, he was a great character actor, but as he said in one of the early interviews, he was just a good old boy. So to close our tribute to James Best, we're going to close with another good old boy, my man, Waylon. Just a good old boy, never meaning no harm, beats all you never saw, been in trouble with the law since the day they was born. I'm a good old boy, you know my mama loved me. She don't understand They keep her showing my hands And not my face on